All right, our fifth video for chapter four it covers section 4.4, which is all about reaction yields, learning what a theoretical yield is, learning about an actual yield, which has to be provided to you, and then using those two to calculate the percent yield for a reaction. Those are the key terms from 4.4 here. Yep. And as we've seen in 4.3, Right. We have relative amounts of reactants that come together to make products. When we have a balanced chemical equation, they come together in what's called stoichiometric amounts, okay, or they're reacting in stoichiometric ratios. And everything that we've considered in the first three chapters in this first half of chapter four, we've just thought about them reacting in stoichiometric amounts. But that's not really realistic. Anything that we set up in the lab or we see occurring in nature, chances are it's not going to react with perfect ratios, just like it's written out in a chemical reaction. Okay. So the example that your textbook uses to illustrate limiting reactant is making cheese sandwiches with a very questionable lunch decision. Right, one slice of cheese and two slices of bread to make one sandwich. So in a theoretical situation where we have 28 slices of bread and a loaf and 11 slices of cheese, uh, then we're capped at making 11 sandwiches following that recipe, that stoichiometric ratio of cheese to bread. Right, because even though we have 28 slices of bread and in theory we could make 14 sandwiches with that, we don't have enough cheese. Okay? So that's what's limiting us. Okay? We are going to have a limiting reactant in cheese. Okay? And then bread is left over. That's called the excess reactant. We'll get to that on the next slide. Okay? Similar to a problem you might encounter with hot dogs. Right? You buy eight pack of hot dog buns, but only a six pack of hot dogs. Right? Doesn't make sense at the grocery store. Or s'mores. If you're sitting around the campfire, Right? You might have only so many graham crackers or Hershey bars, but then you end up having 100 marshmallows. You always have marshmallows left over at the end of the day. Same idea with stoichiometry. We're trying to identify what's limiting the reaction. Okay? So in that previous example, cheese was our limiting reactant. It has limited how much we can make overall. And when a reaction's happening, the limiting reactant gets fully consumed. If all of it is taken up, and that's why the reaction stops. Okay. Whatever is left over right, is called the excess reactant. Okay. So it's always got some of that left over. We can see what that looks like here with pictures. The cheese gets taken up completely. That's the limiting reactant. There's bread left over. That's called the excess reactant. So now to see this with a easy chemical reaction. Okay, consider a chemical process, a reaction between hydrogen gas and chlorine gas to produce gaseous hydrogen chloride. Okay. First thing I need to check, is the reaction balanced? Okay. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two chlorines, a okay, coefficient of two chlorine, yep, everything's balanced. Two of each on the reactant side and the product side. So if I have a theoretical situation where I combine two moles of hydrogen gas, three moles of hydrogen gas and two moles of chlorine gas. Uh, what's going to run out first? Uh, well, that's pretty easy to determine in this case. I, I can see that for every one hydrogen that reacts, one chlorine reacts. And so if I have three moles of H2 and two moles of Cl2, this is clearly going to run out first. It'll take up two moles of hydrogen, there'll be one left over. But chances are they're never going to be that easy. Okay. So we want to learn the solid approach for what we do to calculate a limiting reactant. And the way we do that, right, how we determine the limiting reactant, is we take each of the reactants and just calculate how much product they could make if we used all of it. And then whichever one makes less, of the product is the limiting reactant. So I take both of those reactants, 
hydrogen gas, and chlorine gas. And I used stoichiometry from 4.3 to figure out how many moles of HCl they could make. Okay. So that's shown here on slide 99. I used their stoichiometric ratio. Okay. So it's two moles of HCl for every one mole of H2, or two moles of HCl for every one mole of Cl2. If I used all of my H2, in theory, it could make a maximum of six moles of HCl. If I use all of my Cl2, in theory, it can only make a maximum of four moles of HCl. And everybody knows that four is less than six. So whichever one made less product, that is the limiting reactant. So that's what bullet point three is telling us here. Chlorine, because it made less, is the limiting reactant. The other things are the excess reactants, H2 in this case. And keep in mind, we just mentioned how much limiting reactant is left over. Well, the limiting reactant, by definition, always gets fully consumed. So there's none left over. But we will have a little bit of hydrogen left over. Okay. And that's what this looks like. Again, using figures. I have H2 and Cl2 coming together to react. It makes HCl, but because H2 was the excess reactant, I've got some of that left over. Those numbers that we just calculated for HCl, those are called theoretical yields, which is why you heard me saying how much these things could make theoretically. Okay, so the amount of a product that could be produced by a reaction. Right? We use stoichiometry to calculate it. That's called the theoretical yield. And we calculated the theoretical yield for every reactant there to identify the limiting reactant. Okay, But that limiting reactant controls the reaction overall. So if I jump back to the cheese example, there's no way that I could ever make more than 11 sandwiches without making a trip to the grocery store. Right? So the cheese always controls the reaction overall. In that prior example, Cl2 controls the reaction overall. The lowest theoretical yield is what you use in calculations for percent yield. That's what we have on our next slide. Yep. And then the amount of product that's actually obtained is called the actual yield. Um, and it's typically less than the theoretical yield. That's a number that always has to be provided to you. We just saw how to calculate a theoretical yield. And then jumping forward, you can use these numbers to calculate a percent yield. But how would you ever determine how much an actual yield is without doing the experiment yourself? You can't, right? So if it's a word problem and you're asked to calculate percent yield, you can calculate the theoretical yield yourself. But in order to calculate percent yield, the actual yield is a number that's provided to you. When you do experiments in the lab, the actual yield is typically lower than 100% or the theoretical yield overall because there's a number of things that can go wrong, right? You could have an incomplete reaction. You might lose a little bit of your product when you're trying to isolate it. There might have been a competing side reaction. You will also run into situations throughout your chemistry courses where, you, where you'll get an actual yield that's higher than the theoretical yield, right? which doesn't seem like it makes sense right? without violating the law of conservation of matter, but that's because products are typically wet. If you don't fully dry a product and you have water molecules still floating in there, it adds extra mass. Okay? So, you could get an actual yield higher than the theoretical yield. It's just not common. That being said, if you calculate a percent yield of you know, 400,000%, then chances are your math's wrong somewhere. So that brings us to the final calculation here from 4.4, percent yield. Yep. That is the extent to which the theoretical yield has been achieved. So we take the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield multiplied by 100 to get a percent. Keeping in mind, just like a mass percent from chapter three or a PPM from chapter three, these units have to be the same for actual yield and theoretical yield. You can use whatever you want, right? You can use grams over grams or moles over moles, but they have to be the same so that they 
eliminate one another in the numerator and the denominator, and then we just get a percent overall. So we finish with an example. Upon reaction, this is 4.13 from the textbook, upon reaction of 1.274 grams of copper sulfate with excess zinc metal, I make 0.392 grams of copper metal. And then I'm given a chemical equation and asked to find the percent yield. Okay. So the very first thing that you want to get in the habit of checking is, is the reaction balance. Just drill that into your mind for the rest of my course, at least, and any other chemistry course you take. Every time you see a chemical reaction, just quickly check, is it balanced? Okay, so I've got one copper, one copper, one zinc, one zinc, one sulfur, one sulfur, four oxygens, four oxygens. Everything's good in this case. But especially on tests and homework, make sure that you have a balanced reaction. Okay. And then let's think about these numbers. Okay, 1.274 grams of copper sulfate. Yep. So that's this guy right here. And then this is actually a nice problem because I'm not asked to calculate the limiting reactant. It tells me that zinc was in excess. So that means I can determine right away, okay, zinc was excess. Therefore, by definition, right, copper must be the limiting reactant. And I'm told that it makes 0.392 grams of copper. So that's corresponding right here. And I'm asked to find the percent yield. So what that's going to be, right, the percent yield is going to equal the actual yield of copper divided by the theoretical yield of copper times 100. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, that 0.392 I'm given, that's the actual yield of copper that's gonna go into my calculation. But I need the theoretical yield of copper. And that has to come from the only other number I'm given, 1.274 grams of copper sulfate. So I start with that, 1.274 grams of copper sulfate. And I think to myself, can I convert that to grams of copper? Well, I can't go directly. I, you can never go straight from grams to grams, right? That's what stoichiometry is all about. You always have to go to moles first. But I know how to do that. That's an old chapter three type problem. I, I use the formula mass of copper sulfate. which I would have to calculate from the periodic table, right? adding one copper, one sulfur, and four oxygens together. That'll take me to moles of copper sulfate. And then how do I relate moles of copper sulfate to moles of copper? That's what stoichiometry is. That's from 4.3. So for every one mole of copper sulfate, it make, that reacts, it makes one mole of copper. And where am I getting those numbers from? It's these coefficients, which in this case is nice. There are no coefficients, but that just means that it's a coefficient of one. Right, so it's a one-to-one -one molar ratio of copper sulfate to copper. And I know that because my reaction is balanced. Okay. So I've gone from grams to moles of copper, but to plug it in this calculation and make sure that the units match, I need to go to grams of copper. Okay. So how do I go from moles of copper 
to grams of copper. Again, I'm using the formula mass, 63.55 grams. So then I plug that into the calculator. Right. 1.274 times 63.55 divided by 159.6. It comes out as 0 0.292. grams of copper. And that is what goes in for the theoretical yield. Then I plug in right, my two numbers into my calculation. And, oh, that's not right. I had a mis misprint in my calculator. 1.274 times 63.55. Divided by 159.6 at 0.507. I had typed in 36. And that is what goes in for our theoretical yield. So that's a good tip for you guys right there, right? I said percent yields are typically less than 100%, and that's how I caught myself with that number because my original 0.292 was less than that 0.392. So that's how I realized something was funky there. So I plug in percent yield, right? My actual yield, 0.392, divided by my theoretical yield, 0.507 times 100. Okay. All of that information is given to you on slide 104 and then 105 right, for a final answer of 77.3%. So those are the key ideas from section 4.4. Yep. Know how to calculate a limiting reactant. Know what limiting and excess reactant mean. Know how to calculate theoretical yield. And then given an actual yield, know how to calculate percent yield, which is what we did just here. Those are the takeaways from chapter 4.4, which build on the earlier material from 4.1 and 4.3.